online. Um, I should apologize for last Sunday for kind of responding to what I thought was going on in the room and, and, and afterwards realized that um, we just kind of left you hanging when the stage was vacant and people were praying and you couldn't hear what was going on. So um, that's on me. I apologize for that. Um, we'll try and be more mindful uh, in the future. Uh, this morning, I want us to look at Philippians chapter 4. We're cruising through the book of Philippians. Um, last week, we talked about that theology matters. And as we were unpacking that, one of the things I said is that theology matters because Paul says Lord 15 times. He talks about the reign of Christ, the return of Christ. He mentions the word gospel eight times, which is its own theological package. Uh, he mentions God 24 times. He mentions God as Father three times. Uh, he mentions the Holy Spirit five times. He refers to Jesus by name uh, 38, 22 times, and he calls Jesus Christ or Messiah 38 times. So although this is one of the most personal of Paul's letters, it is still drenched in a theological framework. And, and so theology matters. And this morning we're going to finish this section of Philippians, and, I, and what I want to say up front is that this section of Philippians emphasizes that your mind matters. Uh, your brain counts. Uh, your, your mind is essential to the Christian life. And so, if you have a Bible, uh, open it up to Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse one again, but um, we're going to go through verse 9. So whether on your Bible or your device, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Euodia and Suntuke to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I also ask you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement, also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all people. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then on to what we're going to be looking at today. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think on these things or dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do these things and the peace of God will be with you. So, Father, this morning, uh, there's already been a lot to take in, and, Father, we continue to be sobered uh, by the times in which we find ourselves li living. We're sobered, we're saddened, but our circumstances do not lift from us uh, our call to follow Jesus Christ and to live on mission. To, to live our lives in such a way, to conduct our conversations in such a way that, that we have the opportunity to say that even if there be great darkness, this is the great darkness where God is present. And so, Father, we pray that, that we would walk in a manner worthy of our Lord. Lord, that we would live a life that reflects the heart of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, Father, in an age of reaction, may we turn to reflection and may we allow the Spirit of God to not only control our minds, but to develop our minds. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at this passage together, Paul has two commands for us uh, here in what we just read today. The first one is think. 
It's in the imperative, it's a command, and the second one is do. So we think and then we do. And even when he commands us to do, what we do do is based on what we think because what we do grows out of everything he says that you have learned and received and heard and seen. So, so four verbs that apply to our minds. Okay? That, that our doing grows out of our thinking, staying within the vocabulary of the passage this morning. And so as I've been thinking about that, reflecting on it this week, yesterday I found that I kind of found myself thinking and reflecting in a, in a way that surprised me because part of it for me is uh, I, I've been frustrated a, a, a long time with the fact that the word Christian really doesn't mean anything unique or distinct anymore. That if someone knows they're not Jewish or they're not Muslim, then they must be Christian, e even though that, that, that can mean almost anything. Very few people will say, well, I'm just nothing. You know, you know, or, or, or more specifically, will just say, I'm an atheist or I'm a theist. They, if they don't know what to grab for, they grab for Christian. And, so, and that's been going on ever since I first became a follower of Jesus in my 20s. Um, and then, but over the last months, several months, I've, I've been hearing, you know, follower of Jesus a lot more frequently. But I'm starting to get frustrated by that because it's becoming increasingly very mushy. Um, uh, it's, that... that if you say, well, I, I'm not that kind of Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, it, it's a sense of saying, I'm nice. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm the likable variety. Okay? I, I'm, I'm the, the, the kind, but, but the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, the supremacy of Jesus Christ, everything that, that I've been taught to revere about Jesus Christ is now sometimes being lost because... You know, God forbid Jesus should be angry or he should talk about the judgment of God. That, that it's, it's more just kind of the mushy middle that's, that's, that's not being, from my perspective, suitably defined anymore. Because we, I hear a lot of followers of Jesus, but I don't hear a lot of followers of Jesus proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... Yesterday, when I was kind of reflect, reflecting on, on this and kind of thinking the, thought, the, the salty thoughts of someone who is increasingly frustrated with, with things, um, I, I found myself reading Paul and reflecting and saying, this is going to be kind of a reach, and it almost sounds cult-like, uh, because we don't reflect in this manner much anymore, but I've decided that I'm going to start to introduce myself as a Trinitarian. Um, uh, uh, because cause that's... That's what's really unique about us as followers of Jesus Christ, as Christian people, is, is that we believe a God who has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, you, you, you can't have God lacking in any one of those areas, but to say that we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we proclaim a mystery. I have faith that, that this mystery God has reached out to me in the person of Jesus Christ and has filled me with this Holy Spirit that this moves me in particular directions because I think God, in a world of uncertainty, God has revealed enough about who he is and what he expects for us to have certainty. Okay. There's, in, in fact, it's interesting. For those of you who are familiar with 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul speaks with confidence and certainty about love, love is patient, kind, it doesn't rejoice in wrong, and on and on he goes. And then, as he's moving out of the certainty of love, he talks about the uncertainty of life. He talks about, I think like a child, I act like a child, but one day in the future I'll become an adult. He talks about, now is the imperfect time, but when Jesus Christ returns, it will be the return of the perfect. Or he says, I, I, I live looking through a mirror dimly. He's confessing that there is so much that we are uncertain about, but God has revealed himself in such a manner that upon that revelation, my mind can have certainty. My life can have focus. 
And so as I was reflecting on these verses this morning, uh, I, I want to think about it as, as a Trinitarian. I, I am a Trinitarian, which means my understanding of God is not mushy. It's not uncertain. I have been given focus, and I've been given understanding, none of which permits me to be arrogant, hostile, or judgmental of others. But it does allow me to share my faith without ambiguity or certainty. And if someone has a question that, that closely fits in with the certainty with which God has revealed himself, I'm to speak with certainty. Not hem and haw, not apologize, because it's, it's, it's my faith. It reflects a faith of my people. I'm not telling anybody that they have to have my faith. But for me to be ambiguous, appear uncertain out of some misbegotten notion that I should just simply be nice. You could be nice. I, I've, I've never had someone share their love of food and, and tell me the greatest restaurant they've ever, ever eaten at or the greatest movie they've ever seen and not be nice. And, and if I tell them, well, you know, I haven't eaten there yet or I haven't seen that film yet, so I don't know, I've never been met with hostility. You, know, you, you can be certain and kind. You can be forthright and nice. You can have convictions and express care. There's nothing about the certainty of our faith that warrants us to be jerks. Trinitarians should be the kindest people in the world. We should also be clear and focused and resolute and living on point. So this morning I want to share with you three reflections based uh, on this passage. The first is this. A Trinitarian mind is essential to the Trinitarian life. Okay, what, what Paul eventually moves us to to do these things requires us to think on these things. And and therefore, let me just say, you have never had a mindless experience. So, so people who tend to say, especially if we're coming out of a charismatic Pentecostal environment, and, and we say, you know, who cares about our minds? It's what we think, what our theology is. It's about our experience. Well, it is about our experience, but you've never had a mindless one. I mean... What, what is processing your experience? And it's not about the mind, it's about the heart. Well, folks, the heart resides between the ears. Okay, what, how, however we, we live and reflect, it, it happens through our minds. On the day of Pentecost, when, when Peter preaches and he says, and Old men and young men shall dream dreams and shall prophesy. It's all happening in the mind. You dream in the mind. The brain is actively working when you dream dreams. Your brain is actively engaged when you prophesy. If our minds didn't matter, we wouldn't have this book. God has given us a revelation that, that is processed with the minds that he gave us. You've never had a mindless experience. Let's just get that out of the way. Sometimes, and listen, how often has this happened to you? That was the worst experience ever. And then five or ten years later, you look back on the worst experience ever, and your mind now tells you that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Or that was the best experience ever. How many times did I think that when I wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ and I was getting loaded or drunk with friends and we thought, oh, that last night was the best time ever. And then later on you begin to say, those, those weren't the best times ever. You've never had a mindless experience. You can have thoughtless experiences. 
but you have never had a mindless experience. So can we, can we just perhaps start there and agree that, that, that your mind is essential Your mind processes your experiences, I think, almost at the speed of light. Your mind processes emotion, people, perceptions. You know, it's interesting, five, seven years ago, whenever, when Disney released their last version of the Jungle Book, which was all produced in front of a green screen in a room that was smaller than this, uh, but the question was, could they use a live child as Mowgli, or could they animate the child in the same way that they were animating the animals? And so they did all kinds of tests with test crowds of the computer-generated child and the computer-generated animals and which animals were real and which ones were computer-generated. And for the overwhelming majority, people couldn't tell the difference between the animated animals and real animals. But they instantly recognize that the child is fake. And the reason what they found is, is that we have 221 facial recognition points that we instantly look at to tell whether what we're seeing on the screen is human or not. And we have about 10% of that for non-humans. I mean, in the blink of an eye, in an instant, our brain can process whether what we're looking at is truly human or not. Okay. Our minds are active all the time. Every minute we're, 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 we're processing. Is that person genuine? Are they not? Are they faking it? Are they not? Language, eyes, eyebrow position. Position of the lips. We have, have you ever seen the pictures of the angry profile uh, where they take pictures of our hemispheres and they put like two right sides of your face together and a person can look hostile, two left sides of the face together, person looks more happy and amenable because we register emotions even in a resting position in different ways in the different hemispheres of our face. And our mind is taking that all in. How could our minds not matter? How could our minds not be essential? So the first thing is, is that a Trinitarian mind is essential to a Trinitarian life. Secondly, a Trinitarian life is framed by a Trinitarian mind. I say that. A Trinitarian life is framed by a Trinitarian mind. Now, even though this is not one of the most, quote unquote, theological of Paul's letters, it is still has a theological framework throughout it. And, and, and the whole thing with it is, is that, like in every other letter, Paul has a, has, a, has a way of doing this. He takes the biggest theological ideas. He takes big ideas about God and he lays them out and he reminds us of them to address little spaces. He takes the biggest spaces about God and then he applies them to the little places in our lives. And so, for example, he, he says this. Have this same attitude that was in Christ. So that's kind of a little space Right? This is kind of like have attitude. I can get my mind around attitude. Um, but he just says, have the same attitude that was in Jesus Christ. And then he goes into, who though he was equal with God, did not count his equality with God as something to seize or to grasp, but he willingly emptied himself out in the form of a servant. And oh, by the way, at one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. Oh, by the way, ha have, have this in your little dinky space of life. Ha have this attitude. You see how he takes a big space 
almost in a way that overwhelms our little space. It's just the opposite. He doesn't jump straight to method. That, that's how it works today. Your best-selling books, your best-selling Christian seminars, uh, they're, they're all tips. They're, Tips to get along. Four steps to a happy marriage. Do X, Y, and Z. Four steps to financial. Four steps to financial health. Do X, Y, and Z. Everything's like a. Everything's like a little step. It jumps straight to method. Whether it's Deepak Chopra or anybody else, they 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 jump straight to method. No one begins like Paul and says, you know, here's some things before we get to your issue. Here's some things to think about. Is there a God? Has he revealed himself? Has he said this? What's the purpose of life? Is there eternal life? Is, is, there, is there a judgment? Is there a way to live your life morally which might be absolute and pleasing uh, to God if there is a God? What's love? How do you think about love? How do you, it, in other words, Paul explores these big spaces and then out of that, out of those big places, those big spaces, he makes application to our little lives. So even statements then that we can kind of quote and then sound so, so manageable. Walk in a manner worthy of Christ. Philippians 1, verse 27. So you should walk in a manner worthy of Christ. Okay. Walk in a manner worthy of Christ of the one who is the Lord of heavens and earth. Now that gets you back into the big places. There's no little space that Paul doesn't invade and surround with big space analogies, big space foundations, big space, big place truths. Because a Trinitarian life is framed by the Trinitarian mind. And thirdly, a Trinitarian being leads to Trinitarian doing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, uh, The Cost of Discipleship, he has this amazing little phrase. Only those who believe obey. Only those who obey believe. And the reason why that's such a good phrase is, is that it, it, it frames, again, big spaces with little places because if you don't have the big space filled with this revelation that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sin against us, but has made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God or right with God, as Paul writes elsewhere, if, it turns the relational response, which is obedience, into keeping the rules, following the rules. Following the rules is not obedience. Following the rules is just that. It's following the rules. Obedience is a response of faith. Obedience is a reflection of faith. Obedience is an expression of faith. And on the flip side, if you say, I believe that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, which means he's reconciling me, then my response to that truth is obedience. Any of us who have a dog knows that a healthy dog, a happy dog, obeys because of the relationship, not because of fear. That there's an attentiveness there. A Trinitarian life is born of a Trinitarian being, which means that women and men who are reflecting deeply on the big space, on the big places that God inhabits, will be women and men 
want to live their life to do the things that we have been taught, that we have been learned. And by taught, I don't mean four steps. I'm not talking about methodological teaching. I'm, I'm talking about the teaching of revelation that is contained in this book. I'm talking about what Paul's referring to here is the presentations that he made of the vastness of God who has loved us so personally in the person of Jesus Christ. Which means that the doing flows from the reflection, from the being of our minds. The state of our minds affects the doing of our life. Which beckons the challenge, going back to verse 8, what are you fixing your minds on? What, my, my, I have a family member who sends me almost daily news feeds that are guaranteed to incite anger, exasperation, frustration. Listen, I don't care what you watch, whether it's MSBC, Fox News, One America News, wh wh whatever. Filling your mind with that is going to only make you an angry person. Where do you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ expressed in any of those broadcasts? Where do you hear the lordship, the uniqueness, the supremacy of Jesus Christ expressed in any of those broadcasts? What about those broadcasts are going to, to make you, inspire you to reflect on the grandeur of God's creation? on the wonder of being human, on the complexity and the simplicity that we see surrounding us on a daily basis? What, what about those broadcasts are going to cause you to reflect with joy about just how fearfully and wonderfully God has made a human being? What about those broadcasts are going to cause you to, to, to want to give your life and surrender to Jesus Christ? What about those broadcasts are going to cause you to think about the mercy and grace and love of God? What about those broadcasts is going to inspire you to think with wonder and, and, and want to look for the serendipities of God in daily life? Absolutely nothing. Those broadcasts are sucking vitality out from between your ears. When was the last time you read a book that was just a reflection about the beauty of God? When was the last time you read a book that was just a reflection on the cross of Jesus Christ? When was the last time you read a book that was a reflection on, on the richness that God presents us with when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. When was the last time you read a book on the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Or the kingdom of God? Our failure as a church in America to reflect deeply sets us up to react, to react hostily. Our failure to have the kind of deep reflective frameworks like we see from Paul in his letters means that when unpleasant, tumultuous crisis times occur, your response will not be born from reflection. It will be a knee-jerk reaction. It means that you will flock to people who think like you think. Who th but the trouble is that the people who think like you think are not necessarily Trinitarian women and men. Yeah. 
And the other thing that will happen is you'll start pulling verses at random out of the Bible because there's no framework there. You're like building a house with two by fours without a plan, without skill. TikTok is funny, but two hours of TikTok a day is going to empty your mind. Catch up with your real friends on the phone, the text message, or an email. But scanning Facebook for hours is going to empty your mind. Just read a study through a research project at Fuller that, and, and actually it's led by a, a professor at San Diego State, that after five plus years of study, there is no doubt about it that Instagram is, is dangerous to, to younger generations. It's dangerous to their mental health. No doubt about it. That for the majority of younger people who spend a, a certain amount of time a day on Instagram, it will affect adversely their mental health and self-perception. I don't know why, but I even have daughters who, who say, I've, I've given up Instagram because I found it was damaging my self-esteem. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do these things, and the God, get this, and the God of peace will be with you. That peace, it's the Greek word arene, but it's, it's translating the Hebrew word shalom. It's more than just having a warm fuzzy. Peace is the absence of conflict. It's the presence of wholeness. It's this deep awareness that I can live at peace even though the world seems out of control and falling apart. Because it's not because I've got my head buried in the sand and I'm trying to be in a constant state of denial of what's happening around me. It's because as I reflect deeply on what God has revealed in Scripture, I begin to see that I can have peace. I can experience peace. You talk about experience? It comes as a consequence of our minds being engaged. A life devoid of a Trinitarian mind and experience will become weak, routine, impressionable, and compromised. It will seek satisfaction elsewhere while it will be satisfied by the aligning thoughts and perspectives that at the end of the day are expressions of godless rationalism and idolatry at the worst. Your mind matters. It's essential. It's a bucket that can be filled with understanding that will ground us as a community to respond out of devotion, which in and of itself is an expression of reflection. And I've heard the excuses over the years, I, I don't read. I'm just not a learner. 
I've never met a woman or man that, that doesn't read what's important to them. If you're doing Facebook, you're a reader. If you're doing Instagram, you're a reader. Books are on Audible now, so you can t listen to an Audible book. But you'll learn, you'll read, you'll invest yourself in what matters to you, what has importance. I hear all the time, I'm not a techie, right? But then I see everybody's working their phones. Okay. All, all the non-techies in the world, they've learned how to manage their phone, their camera, download apps, go on Facebook, go on Instagram, whatever, get their latest TikToks out three months and then everybody has TikTok apps on their phone. I mean, we're all techies at some level and we will arise to the occasion that means to us what we value, what reinforces what we value. It's that we're human. That's what human beings do. They adapt, they learn for what's important. And unless and until Governor Newsom or President Biden or previous President Trump, whomever calls me on the phone and asks me what I think, <laughs> I'm just not going to fill my mind with that chunk. And if they did call me on the phone and ask what I thought, I'll be honest with you, my first thoughts are going to have nothing to do with COVID. They're going to have everything to do with seeking peace for a nation that can only come from one person. So whatever is pure, Whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, think, dwell on these things. You know what the great thing is? Paul didn't say, here are four steps to dwelling. Here's four, here's, here's four steps to happy thinking. Here's ten disciplines of peace. Because you know what? He knew something, and I actually know something that Paul knows. Which is, if that matters to you, if you call yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, a Trinitarian believer, whatever phrase works and motivates you, then I know what he knows. You don't need someone to treat you like an idiot and say here are four steps. You don't need someone to dumb it down and say here's four things to do, here's six things to do. Give you a method. Because I know what Paul knows, which is you're all smart and know how to do that. It's just the doing will reflect what you value and what you want to set your heart on. And that becomes the litmus, the litmus test of the authenticity of our faith, our belief, and our hope. In Jesus' name.